So welcome everyone to the fourth lecture uh, of the final module of this uh, training course on data processing and ana analysis tools. Um, as usual, please post your questions in the chat during the lecture. Uh, we will collate them and ask questions after the lecture. Uh, and of course, also, as usual, um, all of the lectures will be recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, I will put a link into the chat a little bit later um, so you can find all the previous and this lecture as well um, online. Um, so this week, um, it's a pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. David Moffat. Uh, Dave is an artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, data scientist at Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK. And he's worked on uh, applying artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to Earth observation data to formulate a better understanding of the natural world. His particular research focus is on the application of novel AI methods to extrapolate uh, to unobservables in remote sensing. His background is in applied AI with a focus on signal processing and time series data. He studied uh, artificial intelligence and computer science uh, in a bachelor degree at the Uni Un Edinburgh University and then went on to study signal processing and computer science at Queen Mary University of London. Um, since then, he has worked as a postdoctoral researcher and university lecturer before moving to PML. He has published numerous peer review papers, has run seven different AI for EO training courses, and has developed a fully online AI for EO training course. And today, of course, he will be talking about AI and machine learning techniques in Earth observation. Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction, Emma. Uh, let me first of all check that you can see my screen. Yes, all good. Um, so, as Emma said, I'm Dr. David Moffat, and I'm going to be talking about an introduction to machine learning for um, Earth observation. Um, I was going to do a slide introducing myself, but Emma did such a good job. Um, I don't think there's really very much to add, um, other than that I'm part of the NERC Earth Observation Data Acquisition and Analysis Service. So that's uh, um, funded by the UK government to do specific Earth observation and some AI work as part of that within the UK. And, and I'm based at Plymouth Marine Laboratory, um, as Emma was saying. Um, so I thought today it would be useful to start off with a little bit of um, disambiguation. Um, there's a lot of language that's used around artificial intelligence at the moment. Um, and in general, there's a lot of different language and some of the terms that are used are, can sometimes be a bit confusing, complex, um, and it's quite important to delineate with, um, with what we mean. So artificial intelligence is, is very popular at the moment. It's been in lots of news stories and I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about it. Um, but artificial intelligence is quite a broad category, and that covers um, many, many different things that sit across a whole wealth of different computer science uh, domains. So this typically means that we're trying to build some sort of thing that looks intelligent and, and is artificial. So you create an artificial system um, that looks intelligent. And the way we typically tend to measure intelligence is, does it look intelligent in a human-like way? Does it do something in a way that humans uh, can evolve? Um, Intelligence is, has its whole branch of philosophies and things like that. So there's uh, a lot of debate as what is intelligence and what's not, and can you find intelligence in the natural world through swarms and colonies and that sort of thing. But um, taking the broadest sense possible, does it look like it's doing something more clever than a, a very simple linear system, essentially? Um, within that, machine learning is a subset. So one of the artificial intelligence approaches is machine learning. And machine learning is a specific uh, approach which is looking at using statistics and using data and the idea is we're learning an awful lot from data to learn something specifically so we're cycling through and we're not um so machine in artificial intelligence we might be um building deterministic approaches that then look clever when you combine a series of different drones or um single celled autonomous together whereas with machine learning you're trying to build something that we use mostly statistics and uh, some probability to try and understand a set of data that you have. 
And deep learning is something that's also quite commonly used interchangeably with machine learning, but deep learning is really a subset of that machine learning again. And deep learning is quite a, a, a novel um, in the area of application. Um, so this is where you can really take some uh, specific machine learning algorithm. And this is where you start looking at things like neural networks, where you have large structures of data and it's considered deep because you, the idea is you're adding more and more layers of complexity as you add these structured data together. Um, I'll go into that into a little bit more detail in a few slides time, but just the idea is that deep learning is a subset of what machine learning is. Um, so I just think it's important to, to, to clarify some of those individual points. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is fundamentally learning from data. Um, so it's essentially a situation where you are looking at trying to learn something without programming it explicitly. So in a traditional sort of programming environment, you would have some data and then you would write some computer program and you'd pass both of these into your computer and then you get that to do some sort of output. So this would be something you've probably seen in all of the other uh, talks that you've had when you're gathering some data from some EO source, you have some program, some sort of uh, algorithm that has been developed and you're combining those two things within the piece of hardware and then you have some output result. Well, in machine learning, we, we turn that on its head and we essentially say, but what if we don't know this program, but we know what we want as an output and as an input. And so essentially what we have is we have our data input, we have some output and we combine them together into our computer and we ask the computer, develop us the program that we want to use. So we're essentially taking the data that we have and just that data that we have and we're instilling it into the computer and we're asking that to develop some program that we can then use. And then you could put it into a more traditional pipeline where you've got this um, machine learning developed program that you could then use for any of your sort of traditional processing. So machine learning is purely learning from data. Um, and there's a number of different approaches that you can take with machine learning. So there's some traditional machine learning approaches. And um, these are ones that um, are typically more than about, have been commonly used more than about 10 or 15 years ago. And this is before the, the sort of large uptake in, uh, in deep learning that's, that's been happening. So these traditional machine learning approaches, you, you have some data, you apply some sort of normalization step to it where you're scaling your data. And then you look at your individual features that you might have. So in an EO context, that might be some particular bands, or you might be looking at identifying bands that are relevant, calculating some indices, and manipulating your data so that you're looking for particular elements. And then you do some model selection. And so that's essentially looking at your machine learning approach, your machine learning algorithm that you want to use. And I've listed a few different ones here. So you've got random forests, you've got support vector machines, you've got dbscan, NFFT, SNE. But the fundamental point is that you've got some deterministic algorithm where you're essentially trying to identify, say you've got two clusters of data, you're trying to identify some definitive boundary or, or some sort of classification or some sort of approach to try and separate them out. And it's all, uh, it's, it's all built through taking very particular step-by-step -step approaches to, to look at how you might uh, apply a particular machine learning method to that data. And then, in comparison to that, you've got the more um, recent developments or deep learning. Uh, and deep learning, as I was saying earlier on, is this um, is where you have these much more complex structures. And in this case, you've got a lot more model design and a lot more hyperparameters to tune. You also need a lot more hardware. So you, with these things, you'll typically need a lot more supercompute or some sort of GPU um, graphic processing units. So you need a lot more compute power to be able to run these. But the idea is that each one of these um, you've got a series of individual nodes, um, and then these all these nodes are connected. So this structure could, uh, is quite often called a neural network. Um, the idea originally being this was drawn from um, how people understood the brain structure to work or human brains to work. The idea that you have individual neurons, which would be each of these dots um, or these circles, and then all these different connections. So lots of different neurons are connected to lots of different uh, other neurons and then the idea is that they can communicate with each other and so each individual line is going to have some weight function and each individual dot or each individual neuron is going to have some very small very simple um, function applied within it so that could be essentially a bit like one of the individual um, traditional machine learning approaches uh, it could be something as simple as a linear regression um, within each node and then you would apply that multiple multiple times 
And as you go through layers and layers or what we call hidden layers, which are these layers in the middle. So you put some data in right at this very front. Um, and then you go through all these layers, which you never see from the outside, and they're all hidden inside. And then you have some output prediction. And the idea is it's deep because you're combining more and more layers of data, to, uh, more and more layers of complex um, machine learning together. Um, and then it, as you go deeper and deeper, the idea is that you can learn more complex structures from the data that you have. Coupled with that, and across both of them, we also have this concept of supervised versus unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is where we have some specific labels and therefore we're trying to learn from a, a particular label. So for example, you have some data and you know that all of these data points are blue and all of these data points are red. And then you're trying to learn some idea of how I could separate these data points apart. So you might be trying to identify some boundary so that you can do some classification. Is this a red or is this a blue? And you're looking at the data that you have, the feature space that you have, and you're trying to identify a boundary. Whereas unsupervised learning is where you have no data whatsoever. So all of these would originally be colored the same color, and you're doing, in this case, a cluster analysis. So you're saying, oh, what cluster do I have? And let's cluster all of them together. And so we can see that we're getting slightly different results in this, and that you can say that these are clear clusters. But if we look at our labeled data, um, some of these points don't necessarily agree with our original labels, but you can understand that they might be different. So supervised learning is where you have some, some labels, something to represent your data. And it's supervised because essentially you are then saying, oh, okay, this is the target that I want you to reach. So it's a bit like you having a teacher marking you every single time and supervising you as you learn. When it's unsupervised, all the machine learning algorithm is doing is looking at all the data that you have and trying to understand the meaning of the data itself without any instruction, without any other um, uh, information other than the raw data that you have. So a good example of unsupervised learning would be cluster analyses, whereas a supervised learning would be a classification. Machine learning often suffers from this concept of a black box problem. So as I was saying earlier, we've got this traditional approach where we have data and a program and we expect an output. Whereas with machine learning, we've got data and an output, and then it gives us a program. For this program, we can it's often challenging to interrogate. It's really difficult to understand what's going on within this model and to identify where it fails and to really understand what this program that you're doing is, particularly when you look at the uh, larger structures, um, such as the deep learning models, um, because you've got quite a lot of complexity, it's very difficult and, and can be quite unintuitive to understand exactly what's going on. And so there's work that you need to do to really try and get into that. And there's a couple of entire fields of research that are trying to answer some of these problems. Um, one of them is explainable AI, where you can try and open up a model and look at different components and justify why things are happening. And the other one is adversarial AI. And adversarial AI is basically where you're building another AI to try and break whatever program you've got, to try and find the edge cases or the situations where your um, machine learning model is wrong and, and where you can force it to do something weird. Um, so this is a really good example of adversarial AI, where you can take a picture of an apple and you can see we get very, very good classification accuracy that this is a Granny Smith apple. But if we just write a paper, piece of paper that says iPod in front of it, um, then all of a sudden this uh, machine learning algorithm is confident that this is an iPod. And this is, an, uh, this is uh, an example of adversarial AI, where you're trying to find a way of breaking, um, breaking the uh, algorithm that you have, because it's getting confused thinking, oh, well, this is now an Apple iPod. So it's making some uh, incorrect assumptions, um, whereas I don't think any human would ever describe this as an Apple iPod without uh, an amount of sarcasm. Um, so, which machine learning methods should I use? Um, I think this is always quite an important thing to discuss. Um, a lot of people are always wanting to jump to the brand new, most complicated thing, um, and everyone wants to be doing neural networks, but sometimes there are cases where it's just not appropriate and it's also not necessary. Um, so this is a report that came out of some UK government research. Um, which was essentially looking across a whole series of domains uh, from language processing, from vision processing. Um, I don't think there was any earth observation in this particularly, but it tried to cover a whole massive range of domains, even medical applications. 
And essentially, this is the really important corner of it down in the bottom left hand corner here. Um, where you can see that's essentially the amount of data that you have. Um, if you have quite a small amount of data, then a traditional machine learning method will work really well. And as you get more and more data, as you get higher and higher on the data scale, that's when suddenly you need to jump into or you want to start investigating neural networks and larger, uh, bigger models, deep neural networks. Um, but certainly when you're down in the lower um, regions of data, it's um, it, a lot of traditional machine learning algorithms will typically outperform because they've got a lot of cubes intelligence and a lot of understanding of the data going into it. So what makes a good machine learning problem? Um, there are a lot of cases where machine learning isn't necessarily the best approach, but I tend to find that good machine learning problems are where human expertise doesn't exist, or that expertise does exist, but it's very difficult to explain. Um, so a, a very a, a good example, an intuitive one of how you can't explain your expertise is the fact that I'm fairly sure every single person can look at pictures of dogs and cats and can tell the difference between them. I think you could see a picture of a cat and say, that's definitely a cat, see a picture of a dog and say, that's definitely a dog. But then if someone said, but why? And you're trying to explain that to an alien who's never ever lived on this planet before and has just arrived. How can you possibly explain in a purely mathematical way to define exactly the difference between a cat and a dog? Oh, well, maybe a dog has a fluffier tail. Well, there are definitely cats that have fluffier tails. Oh, maybe it's because cats have standing up pointy ears. Well, there are entire species of dog that have stand up pointy ears. Um, maybe it's to do with the length of the nose. There's so many different, every single time you find an example or a way of trying to define it, you will find enough counter examples that mean that it becomes impossible. But you can still with confidence look at a picture and say, but that is a cat and that is a dog. And so it becomes very difficult to describe in a way that you could implement into an algorithm um, how you would analyze an image to say that is a cat or that is a dog. Whereas just by labeling enough data and by giving enough examples, the machine learning algorithm can pick up that information um, itself and can understand. Uh, another example is where models must be customized. Uh, a really good example of this is anyone who listens to music streaming services. Uh, there's a number of music streaming services that might have a, a personalized playlist that's ideal just for you. Um, I, I have, I sometimes use Spotify and they make recommendations of the music that I, I like and they, they look at the music I play and they make very good recommendations and they do a very good job. It's not physically possible for them to employ enough members of staff to look at what everyone has played every day and then make suggestions. Um, so really that's the sort of thing that needs to be automated. There's just too many people, too much data. So it really has to be customized to the individual and it's just not possible to do in any other way. Um, and the recommendations that they have are looking at what the content of the audio and also what other people um, that listen to similar music to me are also listening to. So they're they're doing it both based on the sort of the social network side, but also on the actual content of the music and doing spectral analyses um, similar to how we might do in our observation. And um, when models are based on huge amounts of data, so this is definitely the case in uh, in remote sensing when we have massive massive data sets. We've got tens, if not hundreds, of satellites every, uh, that are gathering data every single day. And, and data sets in our conservation can very quickly become terabytes, uh, if not more. And it's just, again, it's just not physically possible for one person to go through and to evaluate every single pixel and every single uh, satellite image. There's so much data that we really need to automate some of these processes um, and where the underlying patterns can be detected and replicated. This is quite important, um, particularly when you relate it to our observation. If it's something that you cannot possibly pick up in the data, if it's something that you don't necessarily have the bandwidth to represent the problem, it's going to be very difficult for any machine learning algorithm to do. If you look at it, or if you get a trained professional to look at some data and they're not able to discern it, it, it could be very difficult for a machine learning problem to solve it. It might be possible, but there, certainly the intuition I typically use is, if it's possible for you to do it with a bit of expertise and knowledge, then it will be easier for a uh, machine learning approach to do it. Um, that doesn't mean that there's a, a hard requirement, but certainly those sorts of approaches tend to lend themselves more. Um, and then you need to start leveraging a lot more complex 
machine learning approaches or get a lot more data to learn more complicated underlying patterns. So what do we need to consider? Fundamentally, as I said earlier, machine learning is learning from data. All we are doing is taking data and learning exactly what's in that data. Nothing more, nothing less. All we have is the data and the data really is what rules the entire machine learning algorithm, the entire machine learning approach. So the data quality is of utmost importance. If we know we can't get 100% top quality data all of the time, that's fine. We need to acknowledge that and we can start building in approaches to try and uh, understand that we have some, some, some noise in the data and try and represent those challenges. Maybe we can put in flags to say that we have strong confidence in this data, weaker confidence in this other data. But fundamentally, we need to know what our data quality is and be confident about our data quality. The size of the training examples that we have, again, if we're learning from data, we need to know how much data we have to represent the problem. And the more examples that you can provide a machine learning algorithm, the better it will do. Stratified sampling and class imbalance. This is where you start looking at trying to do specific cases. You can't have 10,000 examples of one, one class, 10 examples of the other, and then expect a machine learning algorithm to get it right, because it will find a cheat or a hack. And so it will just say, okay, well, class A is, I've got 10,000 of them and I've only got 10 of these. So if I just say it's everything is always class A and not never class B and class B doesn't exist, I've, I've still got 99.9% .9 accuracy. So we need to build systems that will either understand that I need both classes to be represented accurately, or I need to start sampling my data um, and making sure that my classes are balanced as, as much as as reasonably possible. We can also think about data dimensionality and feature engineering. This is what I was saying earlier on about looking at different bands and band ratios. Um, where you might be calculating indices. Um, data augmentation is, I'll go into a little bit more detail, but that's where you can start manipulating your data to try and synthesize more data. So, for example, if you had a satellite imagery of a particular uh, forest and you marked out a particular region, if you rotate that image and then marked out that forest again, that's still a forest. So, you, you can rotate your image and then the areas that you've marked and not marked as, as masking out are still relevant. So you, you can think about ways that you might augment your data so, um, uh, so that you can generate more data. And also how representative is your data? How representative are your data? So if, you're, if your particular study site is um, in equatorial regions, um, does, do you think your data can then extrapolate to um, northern Canadian regions of above 60 degrees? Um, in a lot of cases, Probably not, but it depends on the problem that you're solving and depends on the particular approach. And only you will know that with your domain knowledge, but you just need to make sure that your data are representative. Um, and then your different machine learning approaches will have different degrees of freedom and uh, that will impact the number of data points you need as well. Um, but in order to do this, there's a whole array of different software. Um, here are a few of them that I've listed that are mostly Python based. Um, and I imagine some of this will be touched on in some of the other courses that you have talking a bit about Python programming and things. Um, but this is just to make you aware of all the different software packages that I use quite regularly. Um, and this will be in the this, this slides which I can share. Um, so that's kind of an overview of machine learning specific as sort of in a generic context. Um, and now I'm going to start talking a bit more about how we can apply um, machine learning specifically to Earth observation um, and give it a little bit more context on how you might solve some of those problems. So, fundamentally, EO data covers a wide range of domains from terrestrial to oceanic to atmospheric to climate. And it comes in a whole series of different flavors, essentially, from optical to LIDAR, panchromatic, multi and hyperspectral. Um, there's a massive array of different sorts of Earth observation data that you can use. Um, and these are varying different resolutions, different processing levels. The point is there's a massive wealth of different Earth observation data. And all of these data are different and need to be dealt with in different ways and processed in different ways. And that means we need to consider this when we're also uh, applying this to, uh, to machine learning. 
So machine learning for Earth observation means you're dealing with massive data sets, often multi terabyte data sets, and that can be quite a lot more complex than some uh, other domains of machine learning where you might just be looking at, you know, photos of uh, cars and bicycles and cats and dogs. Um, EO is, is inherently massive, massive data sets, um, and it's also much more complex data sets with multi band, potentially multi sensor. If you're doing some sort of sensor fusion approaches, um, the data complexity that we work with is so much greater than than all sorts of imagery um, and a, a whole wide uh, range of things. Uh, there's also a lot of noise in our data that we have. Um, sometimes this can be sensor error. Sometimes it can be calibration challenges. And also clouds. Cloud contamination is a is a, a very large one, particularly when working with optical sensors. I think I spend a very large percentage of my time just dealing with the fact that I've got clouds in in all of my data, and so that's something that I'm consistently aware of and I need to manipulate. The other thing with Earth observation is we have very few labels, particularly in marine Earth observation. It's incredibly expensive to get a ship out to go and sample in the ocean to take some actual like very, very high quality ground truth samples. And so therefore we have massive amount of Earth's observation, very, very few actual labeled data, um, which brings in more challenges. So you can't necessarily always extrapolate out. And so we need a lot of technology to try and advance this. And there aren't necessarily a lot of off the shelf solutions, um, specialized hardware and things like that. So there's, there, there are other challenges uh, particularly in an Earth observation context, where we might be trying to learn a lot more from computer vision approaches. Um, there's a, a wide range of different machine learning tasks or domains that uh, people typically use, and I was going to relate some of these to Earth observation tasks just to try and again disambiguate some of the um, some of the terminology that people use. So when we talk about a regression task, we'll typically talk about learning some continuous function um, or approximating some sort of a, a continuous function. Um, so in this example, we're looking at bias correction, um, but this could be anything where you're taking a series of input variables and you're trying to predict something on any continuous scale. Uh, so this could be, uh, in, in this case, it's a, a bias correction, but it could also just as easily be a chlorophyll value. If you're trying to predict something that's a continuous scale, in machine learning terminology, it's considered a, a regression problem. Um, we could also look at image categorization. So does this image contain a cloud? Is this yes or no? Um, is this X or Y? And we're, in this case, we're looking at full image. So we've worked on some cloud detection images where we're looking at entire scenes and just say, is there cloud in this image? Yes or no? Are there any clouds in this image? And so we're just trying to do a categorization. We can take this further and instead of just classifying an entire image, we can look at classifying every single pixel within that image. And this is called semantic segmentation. So we're trying to segment an image, we're trying to uh, separate out an image based on some sort of semantic meaning, some sort of context. So in this case, we're trying to do some uh, land cover mapping where we're looking at uh, different um, terrestrial, uh, different um, cityscapes and then forest regions and things like that. Um, but the idea of semantic segmentation is just where you're trying to assign one class Per pixel of your image that you have, or seen probably rather than image. Um, following on from that, we have object detection, and this is where instead of classifying an individual pixels, you're just trying to find the objects in a pixel. So in this case, we're looking at trying to detect individual cars, whether they're driving down a road or whether they're parked at the side of the road. And in this case, we're looking at detecting marine floating debris. So we're looking at trying to detect plastic bags and bottles that have been thrown in the ocean uh, or thrown in the sea from a ship mounted camera. And in this case, we don't really we don't need to measure the, the size of it in terms of the number of pixels, but we want to count the number of different instances that we have. Um, and in this case, we can also provide a confidence as to how confident we are that this is a plastic bag or, or something else. So we're trying to count, we're trying to detect individual objects and, and count them and put a box around them so we know how potentially how large they are as well. And we can take this one step further and do instance segmentation. And this is kind of a combination between the two previous approaches where we both find each individual object and then we apply some sort of classification. Um, uh, we find each individual object and then we count the number of pixels that are within each object. 
And this is quite important, particularly when you get into areas where there's some objects that are very close together. So if we've got these two aeroplanes up here that are very close together, um, with the semantic segmentation, these might have been merged into one continuous space because the pixels are, are almost next to each other or very close to touching. Um, whereas we want to identify that we have two separate planes um, and then we have all the individual pixels that each um, plane contains. And we've got a very similar example with these docked ships where you might have some ships that could be merged into one long one, but we want to identify each individual ship uh, rather than uh, as well as all the pixels that that ship contains. So that is instance segmentation. So these are a whole series of different supervised learning approaches. Um, and we can apply we, we can apply supervised learning to a whole series of different domains where we might try and detect or track things through time. Um, but supervised learning is also highly dependent on the, the labeled data that we were providing. So I kind of mentioned this earlier on when supervised learning relies heavily on having some sort of labels. And so there's a series of different things we can try and do when we don't have labels or if we've got very imbalanced labels or if we've got very sparse labels. Um, these are all the sorts of challenges that will quite commonly come up in supervised learning. And there are a number of strategies that we can do to approach this. Um, so we've got some unsupervised approaches. So I talked earlier about some cluster analysis. Um, we can look at weekly supervised approaches. Uh, weekly supervised just means that you've got very sparse labels. And so you just pick a particular point and then say there's a lot of areas that you don't know. So you're kind of combining this idea of unsupervised with supervised uh, together and merging them together. We have self-supervised learning where you learn a bit more about the actual data that you have first and then apply it to a different domain. And then we have data augmentation. And so I'll take you through all of these in a little bit more. Data augmentation is where you can manipulate your data into different shapes. So unsupervised learning such as cluster analysis would be where you can feed in data with no labels whatsoever and you look at the underlying distribution or um, relationships within the data itself. So in this case here, we can look at global oceans over a time series and we can perform a clustering to try and identify if there's particular elements that stand out within those data. Um, so there's a number of different cluster analysis approaches that you can take, um, but this allows you to identify um, that certain regions might have certain consistent relationships. Similarly, you can do is some sort of signal separation, such as a principal component analysis or non-negative matrix factorization, NMF, um, where you might be able to try and separate out components. All of these approaches are based purely on the data that you feed it in. There's no labels whatsoever. It's just exposing the underlying relationships and patterns within the data that you have. Following on from this, we have weekly supervised learning. And this is where you can really reduce the need for full label data, but you might look at individual pixels that can be labeled. And so in this example, I'm going to talk a little bit about semantic segmentation. Um, so in this case, you've got uh, an input image where you're trying to detect um, uh, some sort of forest region from some sort of dry land. So you might have a, a, an input image with uh, where you have a fully segmented label, where you've got fully labeled data, where you've got all your different classes, and instead you could just produce some sort of weak labeling where you just pick one pixel and say, right, this is the only one that I have a ground truth for. And you can see this would be very effective in cases where we have very sparse sampling. If we're going out on cruises and we can only sample one pixel, we want to learn as much as we possibly can from each of these different locations at each point. And then we ask our machine learning algorithm to extrapolate up from this. Or alternatively, we can put the, uh, the label on the image level. So in this case, we're just taking the maximum, uh, the most uh, common class in this case. So it's the most common blue, 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 and then uh, sorry, yellow, 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 and then in this case, blue. So we can then do it on the uh, image case as well. So we then just are generalizing across the entire image. So we're making a prediction on the image level rather than on the single uh, pixel. I also talked about data augmentation, and this is where you can manipulate your data to try and generate more data. So the few data that you do have that are well labeled, you might try and change it. Um, so in this case, uh, we've got some sort of original data. Um, what we could do is do some blurring so that if there's some very close pixels, then we could maybe have some sort of overlapping interaction. We can also flip it um, and crop it. So if there's some if you know that you can rotate your image and it would still have the same labels and everything would still 
makes sense in terms of both your input image and the label that you've generated for it, then you might be able to flip it or, or crop it and choose the subset. Or you can add some sort of noise to the signal as well. Um, and, and drop out is just where we remove a certain number of pixels and just say we, we don't have uh, the data for these, but we still have a fully labeled scene. Um, so you need to think, particularly with data augmentation, about the context and the project that you're working on. So certain data augmentations will be very relevant, but if you know that you're studying uh, the west coast of Africa, um, and then you start doing a rotation, and then it would start thinking, well, actually, maybe the ocean should be on the uh, on the east side instead. So you need to, or on the west side instead. So you need to consider what is a reasonable augmentation for the particular application domain that you have. It could be that certain rotations are relevant. It could be that a certain amount of intensity variation or adding noise could be relevant. It could be that I just might be adding noise and complexity to the problem that you're solving. So you're going to think and use the domain knowledge that you have about Earth observation as to what is a reasonable augmentation to make. We can also look at transfer learning. So transfer learning is essentially where you build some sort of machine learning model on one data set, and then you transfer everything you've learned from that data set to another data set. And so you could learn on one different on one type of satellite imagery where we have a, a massive long time series such as Langsat, and then transfer that over to a newer data set such as Sentinel-2. And we can really refine it for Sentinel-2 to try and make sure that we've understood what's going on based on Landsat imagery um, and then extrapolate that out so that it becomes more powerful than just learning from the Sentinel-2 data that we have. And this sort of pre-trained model approach can massively improve the results that we have. Um, so there's an example here that we did a number of years ago where we looked at trying to detect a, a glacial front. We're trying to detect the very front of a glacier. So the images down here, we're just trying to detect this, this edge front of this glacier. And you can see that's what this label is. And we're detecting this edge front here. But we didn't have an awful lot of labels. And these labels are all very sparse um, and very time consuming to generate. So we built a machine learning model. In this case, it was called Efficient Net. Um, and we trained it on just images, just standard red, green, blue images. So we looked through uh, a data set called ImageNet. And it's just got lots of cats and dogs and bicycles and sailing boats and um, all sorts of different things. Um, but it is one of the largest image data sets in the world. Um, and we use this image data set to pre-train our model. And the idea is it's learning how it can look at edges, how it can look at shapes, maybe how it can look at circular things that would be eyes for animals. Um, but it's, it's understanding how to differentiate and what sorts of things are important you, that will be important for a sort of boundary condition if you're looking at a boat versus a, a sunset. And then after that, we then took it and then trained it on our much smaller data set. And um, so we were what we call fine tune the model or refine the model on our much smaller data set of glacial fronts. And at that point, we're then able to make predictions. And these are the predictions that actually came out of the model for these two cases here. And we can see it's done a very good job at doing some of the detections. The results are by no means perfect. Um, but in this case here, it's kind of continued on a little bit further. In this case here, it's not quite got to the full edge extent, um, but we've been able to use the concept of learning from large data sets that are pre-existing and translate it onto specific domain that we want using transfer learning. We can also use approaches such as self-supervised learning. And self-supervised learning is kind, kind of a combination between the data augmentation and the transfer learning. So this is so self-supervised essentially means you're trying to make a supervised task out of data that is unlabeled or unsupervised. So you try and have some sort of self-generating label. Um, so this could be a particular transformation that you would have um, that you're then trying to unlearn. Um, this could be trying to um, essentially cut up an image into a jigsaw and then put it back together. There's a whole series of different self-supervising learning tasks. Um, but the idea is that we try and learn some generic task that is quite easy to represent and um, to learn to do our pre-training. And then once we've done that, we can then transfer to a downstream task that we have a lot fewer labels for. And this approach, I think, can really take advantage of a lot of the Earth observation data sets we have um, without the need for hundreds of thousands of labels, which we just don't have. So an example of this 
um, would be if you have a, a what we call an encoder decoder. So the idea is you have an image and you're trying to then just reproduce that image. So you're trying to take that image, you're trying to compress the representation. So this is basically trying to squash it into a smaller number, number of pixels, um, maybe something a bit like a principal component analysis, where you're trying to represent all the data that you have in all the different bands in a much smaller space, and then you try and expand it again. So the idea is you take your image, you try and shrink it, you try and increase it again, and both the encoder and decoder are machine learning models that you learn in parallel. And so then you're learning this idea of, I just want to create this shape, but this compressed representation could encapsulate everything that's in your input image if it's able to replicate everything in the, in the output. And, and then once you have that, you can start masking out parts of your input image, and then your extrapolated output will be able to then predict what's going on underneath these clouds. So in the scene, parts of the scene that it's not been able to see, you can then identify what might be happening, happening underneath this, uh, underneath these clouds. So this is an example of what we can use for gap filling. And um, a particular approach called variational autoencoders, which is a, a type of autoencoder I was just, uh, which is the structure I was just talking about, has been used. Um, and this is to try and look at performing gap filling. So you can see we've got a series of different images where we've got some, uh, some satellite data that we've captured with very, very few gaps. And we've learned this in a, a complete through structure in an autoencoder. So we're learning how to represent this data. And then we start adding cloud to it. So we then start artificially just chopping off sections of it and saying, okay, this has been masked out, this area has been masked out, and this area has been masked out. And then we can look at the reconstruction that different approaches have. Um, so Dini offers a traditional gap filling approach um, and deconstruct is uh, this paper here um, where we're essentially using this autoencoder structure to try and replicate what's happening underneath these clouded regions. So we're understanding what's happening and then replicating them through. And so we're performing a gap filling uh, where we're creating some random gaps to then try and replicate what might be happening in the original image. So that's a, a whole series of different approaches and domains and things we can consider when we're applying machine learning to a whole series of different approaches in our observation. There's a lot of considerations that we need to make as well. Um, we really want to make sure that we get the best out of our data in Earth observation, especially because getting labeled ground truth data can be very, very expensive. Um, so there are always going to be data limitations. You also need to consider the limitations of the sensors and the bands that you have. And if, if it's not physically possible to extrapolate something out of some of those bands, then there might be some real challenges in building in a machine learning algorithm to do that. Um, you also need to consider that you need enough data. Now, enough data, how much data do I need, is an incredibly complicated and difficult thing to answer, and is one of the questions I get asked quite a lot. Um, there's, there's no real hard and fast answer I can give to this, um, but how much data do I need? The, the answer I give every single time is, that depends on the complexity of the problem you're trying to represent. So if you're looking at satellite imagery, and if you're looking at it and you can look at it and you can say, oh, that looks like it's a particular region and you can do some classification on that data, that means you're going to need less data than if you, if you need uh, you know, a doctorate and 10 years worth of study to be able to tell the difference. And if you think you could train a child to very quickly do that labeling of data, then you will need less data. So enough data depends entirely on the complexity of the problem and how difficult it is. You can need to consider your training, validation, and test splits. So when you are building a machine learning algorithm, you are labeling a series of data, and that's what you want to do to, te to test your algorithm to prove how well it works. You also need to separate out data to make sure that you have something that is very independent for tests and very independent for validation. So when we are training a model, we use validation, and we iterate through, and we are looking at validation consistently. So we might use this for some hyperparameter tuning to check what's happening with the data. Only at the very end, when we've built an entire model, do we then touch our test data set. I would typically say for small data sets, you want 30 to 40% test data. For larger data sets, you probably less for your test. 
it's a, the most important thing is make sure your test data at the end is representative of your problem. So if you need to cover a whole series of domains, then your test data needs to cover all those different domains. If you've got a regression problem where you're trying to predict something on a continuous scale, you need things up and down that continuous scale at the extremes and all representing the middle. So you can't just take 10 examples and then say, oh, it works well on these tests, 10 examples, when you've used 100 million to train, because then you don't really have enough test data to represent all of your problems. You need to make sure the test data set represents your problem, and then you're allowed to train with whatever is left over. I find it's often better to start off with a simple approach and then add complexity. Um, first of all, Occam's razor, um, the simple approach is probably the, the best one um, and is the most explainable. Um, there's no point in starting with the most complicated model and trying to get it to work for three months only just to see that actually you could have done it in two days with a much simpler approach. So I always start with a simple approach, see what it can do, and then add complexity. Because if nothing else, that should give you a benchmark for what you're able to achieve. This also helps you prevent overfitting. So overfitting is when you learn too much from your training data and you basically just memorize the training data. And when you try then looking at your validation and test data, um, you can't generalize your model. It's learned too much exactly the domain you're looking at and you can't generalize. You also need to consider how you're going to evaluate your model. Sometimes speed is, is much more important than accuracy. And um, sometimes accuracy is not just the best measure. As I was saying, if you've got 100 million of one class and you've got 10 pixels of another class, you know, is accuracy, is 99.9% .9 accuracy with class B doesn't exist, is that right? Or actually, do you need some sort of balance? Um, what are you trying to do? If, if you're going to go out and intervene and uh, interact with something and sail a ship to go into to, um, uh, sample in a particular location, you want to be 100% sure that you're right. Um, whereas if it's to potentially give some, some early warning systems and you're quite happy that there might be some false negatives, then you need to consider that um, as well. So accuracy isn't always the best measure. And you also need to be aware of what machine learning cannot do. Machine learning is not magic. It's not you can't just sprinkle it on a project and think it will solve all your problems. Um, it really, really depends an awful lot on the quality of the data that you have. Um, and so fundamentally, yeah, if you realize there's a flaw with your data, uh, it's absolutely fine to be unsure about your conclusions and to question some of those conclusions. Um, some stats might be useful to help. Certainly don't train an AI to produce more data just because you aren't sure about your data or you know your data is flawed. All you're going to do is exacerbate that problem. So if you realize your data has flaws, that's a good thing. And you just need to be, you need to make decisions as to what you're going to do uh, at that stage. But fundamentally, you're building a system that learns from data. And so that data is what is uh, entirely going to dictate what's happening within your system. And there are things you can do. There are engineering approaches and tricks you can do to try and work around some of the challenges, as I've discussed, but fundamentally, your data is what's most important. And um, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Dave, for your lecture. I've learned a lot again, uh, and I'm sure the, the trainees have as well. Um, I have a logistic question for TJ. Uh, is the Q&A also recorded and put on YouTube? Normally, we also record the Q&A. Okay, well. yes. perfect. Um, so, Irini, you've asked some questions. You will be able to find uh, find the answers if you have to leave uh, earlier today. Um, so, lots of interesting questions, I think. Um, I'm just going to walk through them sort of in the order of your presentation. Um, and some of them are big questions. Some of them are small questions. Some are very specific. So, I'm yeah. hoping that you can answer them. I'll try my best. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, the first question um, is related to the amount of data. You already touched upon this, uh, but the question is um, how huge would a data set need to be to qualify for machine learning approaches? Uh, does this need to be tens, hundreds, thousands of measurements? And does this number change according to the number of input parameters um, you put into a machine learning model? Um, 
Yeah, so I, I kind of briefly touched on it, but I think it's important to, to um, answer it more directly as well. Um, I have done machine learning approaches where I have had sample sizes of in the order of hundreds. Um, and there are cases where that works fairly well. Um, let's see if I can go back to the. Oh. And so this is kind of where this really comes in. Um, when I'm dealing with data sets in the, in the order of hundreds, first of all, it very much depends on the complexity of the problem. If you think this, you know, we can quite often find linear relationships, but there's one or two things that don't quite fit. And um, maybe you can add some slight complexity beyond the simple linear relationship. That might be the case. Uh, I've done, uh, I've definitely worked on data sets where I've had in the order of a few hundred data points, you know, two, three, four hundred data points. Um, when you start then breaking that down into individual, well, in that case, I was dealing with plankton data, and when we start breaking it down into individual species and then trying to explore different geographic regions, so I was looking at northern and southern gyres. We started ending up with very small data sets in the order of 60 data points. And at that point, I don't think you can really do very much. And there's not very much you can say about it. Um, but certainly in the order of hundreds, there's there's definitely something you can do depending on the complexity of the problem. And that's that's always going to be my caveat. Um, in, in terms of the amount of data on the other end, there's, there's, there's the sky's the limit. The more data, um, I, I, the question at that point is, um, uh, what is the performance you require? Um, everyone always wants 100% accuracy all the time, but I don't believe that our sensors are 100% accurate all the time. So I don't think that's necessarily an achievable goal. Um, so there will always be a, a sort of a threshold performance um, where it, where you plateau. Um, but fundamentally, you could do it in the order of 100s. At which point, I definitely, definitely you need to be looking at some sort of traditional machine learning approaches, and because the neural network is not really going to learn very much, and it's going to be too complex a model to try and learn from that data. Um, furthermore, uh, depending on the data that you have, again, you could look at some sort of transfer learning domain. So in the um, glacial front detection one that I was looking at, I think we only had, I think it was less than 100 examples of some sort of front. But because we were learned, able to learn from some domain and transfer over and have something analogous, uh, we were able to um, really use that data in the most effective way possible. So there's a few things you could do if you don't have enough data um, that you can really explore. But it's very difficult to say without knowing or without having an understanding as to how complicated the problem is you're trying to represent. Thank you, Dave. Um, so another question is um, related to supervised uh, learning approaches and maybe a question in general, um, uh, whether the data um, needs a normal distribution to be used in supervised learning? So, a lot of, so when I talked about traditional machine learning methods, uh, which was before that slide, was it? Um, one of the things I talked about was some sort of data normalization. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially when you have non-normal data, can we perform some scaling to try and try and make it more normally distributed? And so it's ideal if we can get it normally distributed, or if it's log normal, we can do some scaling to put it into a normal distribution space. And um, that tends to work a lot better with a lot more traditional machine learning algorithms. A lot of them um, assume some sort of normal distribution, particularly um, uh, SVMs and things like that. Um, there are other approaches, so random forest is one that doesn't make such stringent assumptions on data distribution. Um, and so it's a bit more capable of dealing with non-normal data, um, but it depends on how heavily skewed it is um, and what, uh, what the cases are. So, it, but generally it's possible to do it when it's not normally distributed. The first thing I do is try and scale it in some way so that it can be normally distributed. Thank you, Dave. Um, there is a question um, related to the importance of input parameters. Um, so when someone uses multiple input parameters to a machine learning model, um, how do how do models deal um, with these parameters uh, when when one is more important than the other? 
um, and um, I think the question is also asked whether um, autocorrelation would be a problem between parameters. So how does machine learning deal with those situations? That's quite a good point. Um, so you need to make sure that essentially when you're trying to learn a system where you've got data and some sort of output prediction and you're trying to learn what this program program is, if it's not physically possible to go from that data to that output, your machine learning algorithm will never have a possibility of learning that. So you need to make sure that your input features um, can represent the output and can represent the problem that you have. Um, it is quite common that you will have features that are correlated and they have some sort of cross correlation between individual features. Uh, wherever possible, I try and remove this, especially when they're very, very heavily correlated because it will certainly bias the algorithm um, in that direction. That's very much more in the sort of traditional machine learning approaches, uh, particularly. So there are things you could do, again, with feature normalization where you try and uh, create a bit more of an independent feature set. Um, so instead of just passing in lots of bands, you could maybe try and create a few indices. Um, I think that's kind of where this the concept of feature selection comes from. So these are your sort of input variables that you have or your input features, and you try and select the ones that are not going to be heavily, heavily correlated, but can still represent the problem. Um, I think this is something that just needs to be explored, to be perfectly honest. I would usually start with a range of optical sensors, and then sometimes I would add in some environmental conditions, and I quite often will uh, try different sets of features, being aware of the things that are very heavily correlated. There's also a series of uh, interpretable machine learning approaches we can do to try and understand what's happening and to try and disambiguate. There's a game theory approach called SHAP, S-H-A-P, um, and there's software toolboxes that can basically apply that to try and uh, dis, uh, disentangle, I guess is probably the word, to try and separate out these features and understand what, what impact each of these features have on the prediction that's being made by your machine learning model. And there's, yeah, so feature correlation is, can be quite a problem. And sometimes I'll remove certain features or try and build some sort of proxy feature um, that combines them to try and remove that heavy correlation between them. Uh, thank you, Dave. I think you've already more or less answered the next question, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Maybe you want to add something. Um, so the question is, um, how do we know if we've missed an important feature um, as an input variable in the model? Um, so how, how would we know? What are we missing things or not? Well, one very clear indication is that your results aren't as good as they could be. So when your results are poor, um, clearly you're not represent, you, clearly the model doesn't have the data uh, as an input feature mm -hmm. to represent the uh, the problem it's trying to solve, and um, so you need you need to be able to represent the output expected output distribution from the input features. So that's one very clear way. If you're not able to get good results, then there must be something missing um, that's driving that. Now it might be that your model can compensate for that in some way by coming up with some proxies, um, or it get or it goes very wrong in particular circumstances. So maybe in extreme values it goes incredibly wrong, but in the sort of the, the middle of the distribution, it gets it very right. That might be a case where you've missed something. Okay. And here, I assume your domain knowledge comes in. Yes, um, yeah. absolutely. Okay, because you've talked about that quite a lot. Um, all right, thank you. Um, so the next question is about um, combining uh, data from different sensors. You've talked a little bit about that and EO data can be very complex. And so in this specific question, um, there's a that, that's related to Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 data. So they're both uh, multispectral images, um, but there might be discrepancies between those two images because the sensors are slightly different. different. Would you, before applying a remote sensing or a machine learning approach, correct that data um, or would you just put everything as is in the machine learning model? I think if it's possible to correct that data, then you're going to make the machine learning algorithms approach 
easier. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know the differences between the bands, but I don't know if there's a small amount of band shifting that you would need. And um, certainly making sure they're on the same grid, and if possible, to do a small amount of band shifting to align things is going to make it easier for the algorithm to solve. Uh, particularly if that's not the problem you're trying to solve. If you're looking at ways of fusing these together, then you could. That that's a a slightly different problem. But if you're yeah, I, I would definitely do pre-processing to try and align your data as much as possible to make sure it covers a consistent distribution. Um, because just throwing in more things that have a slight offset might be challenging. Um, unless that's the particular data augmentation you want to apply, where you try and transform one into one band and one into the other to try and increase the amount of data that you have. But there's there's risks that you would just be adding noise if you didn't correct for that first. Thank you. I'm gathering from your from your answers and from your presentation in general that it's good to start with the right data. So Absolutely. you prepare your data as best as possible before you even start. Um, Absolutely. applying machine learning techniques. So I think that's like a general thing that people can can keep in mind. Um, the, data, the data is king. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next question is quite a specific question. So someone is working on um, uh, water habitat classification in shallow waters. Um, okay. And they are um, asking uh, whether AI or deep learning um, can run together um, with water column corrections, um, and what they ask, they are asking whether they should first correct the water column in the images before they use classification techniques. Um, I guess the answer is again, prepare your data as best as possible. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm not familiar with um, water column correction approaches, but my with with no domain knowledge in that space, my my assumption would be, uh, if you provide your machine learning method with better, more consistent data, um, if it can be normally distributed, then that it makes life easier for everybody, and that means your results are going to be better. So otherwise, you need to either try and restructure your data to be normally distributed. Um, so yeah, definitely prepare your data as best you possibly can before applying a machine learning algorithm. Thank you, Dave. Um, there is a question related to um, the considerations and the limitations you've talked about um, and whether it's necessary to have different validation and test data. So this is something that happens very regularly in machine learning and I, I personally would say that it is because when we're using these large scale models, particularly when we're looking at deep learning, there's an awful lot of hyperparameters, and you'll tweak this model and you'll tweak this bit here. And essentially, the, the training data is the bit that you are that your model is learning from actively. The validation data will be the bit of data that you are changing all your parameters for. Um, and so there's a very real danger that you end up overfitting the parameters you're changing to your validation data. And if you don't have something that's independent, that's completely unseen for the test data then you don't know if you've just tweaked parameters so that it fits the training to the validation. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially there's a, a risk that you might just be over optimizing to that validation data set if you don't have an independent further test set. Um, that's probably only the case in larger data sets. So that's going to be the case when you've got hundreds of thousands of labeled data sets in, in images and things like that. Um, if you're on the order of hundreds or a few hundred data points, you really, you probably can't afford to do that. And, but also if you're using traditional machine learning methods, which you would be when you've got much smaller data sets, um, that's going to be less important because you've not got as many parameters to, to tweak and to change in the same way. Whereas with these neural networks that are large deep neural networks, you've got mo a lot more model architecture and number of layers. And there's so many hyperparameters to, to modify that um, it then becomes very easy to over engineer to that particular validation data set. Thank you, Dave. Um, there's another very specific question, which I'm just going to read. Um, so Sabrine performed a random forest algorithm to make mm -hmm. a prediction after transforming the target variable using the Boxcox transformation. 
Um, she found an R square of around 0 0.65, but the scatter plot between the measured and the predicted data shows an overestimation of low values and an underestimation of high values. Um, how would she go about to search for a solution for the over and underestimation? Um, so, first of all, this probably depends on how your data are distributed. Um, so, if you have the same number of samples of all your data, then that would be surprising. But I suspect what's happened in this case is that all the data around the center, you very, very heavily sampled, and the data on the extreme values are underrepresented. Um, so you have so they're much more sparsely sampled because extreme values are just less common. Mm. Um, so it might be that you need to consider the the data balances there, and just that the the two extremes uh, are not represented. It might also be that you have an input variable that you need to consider that hasn't been included within this context. Um, so there might be some other variable, uh, an environmental factor, uh, some other bands, a particular index, and um, that could be included. Um, as a as a predictor that would help that prediction as well, um, I would I would go further and try and start looking at if there's any difference between any of these variables, um, what the distribution is of that data, and why those things are not represented, and see if there's something that you can do there. Um, it might be that you need to resolve some class imbalance, and there are there are tools and libraries you can look at trying to resolve that. Um, but that would be my two thoughts. Um, thank you, Dave. Uh, those are two good, good leads, I think, um, that Serene can follow up on and, and investigate herself. I see there are a um, couple of more questions uh, in the chat, quite long questions. So um, let me double check. Um, so. Um, so there's there's a question from Pedro. He it's quite a long question, but TJ has summar TJ has summarized it a little bit. Um, if we are interested in a couple of classes um, in an image, do we need to classify them all, or can we just focus on the specific classes that we're interested in? Um, so it would be possible to say these are the classes I'm interested in, and then you could create an, an other class or an uninteresting class. Um, that's definitely possible to do. You need to think about that class imbalance problem again, and there are certain machine learning approaches that will lend themselves well to dealing with that, um, and certain that won't. So the more traditional machine learning algorithms might have a bit more of an issue. Um, but it might be that you can create an other class, and so long as you've got an even distribution of all the other things that could be in that other class, you can put everything into one class and then kind of bury it away so that you don't need to label every individual pixel. And uh, that's probably the first approach that I would take in that instance where I only have uh, a few certain labeled classes, um, or start looking at the weekly supervised approaches where you just have certain pixels that are labeled. In those examples, I have one pixel for each individual. Um, image tile and um, but you could label certainly label more of the interested ones and then say everything else is other uh, and that could certainly work as an approach thank you dave um there is a question about um old aerial images in black and white and whether any machine learning methods could deal with such images to extract classifications that entirely depends on what you're trying to Extract. Uh, I've, I'm working on projects studying sand dunes from black and white images, um, and it's working quite well to detect specific ripple patterns on those sand dunes in, in black and white images. So it's definitely possible to extract something. It depends on what you're looking for. Um, it might be difficult to do um, chlorophyll estimates from those because you don't have the individual bands to do that, but it, so it depends on the specific question to try to solve, but there's definitely something that can be done. Um, thank you, Dave. Um, there is another another quite long question that just came in, so I'm just trying to read through it quickly. Um, okay. While you're doing so, that, can I, can I jump in yeah. with a question? Yeah, go okay. for it. Uh, so, Dave, I think looking at everything you've just presented and the way you've answered some of those questions, one of the big things when it comes to machine learning, especially for people coming to it 
for a, a new application is that actually most of the time you need to invest is on properly forming your hypothesis, what your like positive and negative result, like what's the, what's the confirming result, what's your metric that you're going to use to to assess performance. All of that actually requires quite a lot of thinking, human thinking, before you hand over to the kind of AI thinking. So it's a little bit, I mean, that's part of, if we go way back to some of the earlier lectures on the scientific process, right? It's about forming a good hypothesis and having good questions. And this is about um, making sure that you know that you can use the data you have to ask a question um, and you know what, uh, let's say, a, a confirming or refuting result would be of that hypothesis. Um, and I think, um, I was just going to say, I mean, is that something I think that, that you basically need to not say hone your skills, but it's something that when you start to work with machine learning, it's something you really develop uh, more of? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. You need to follow the, the scientific method. You need to come up with an understanding of the domain you're working in, an understanding of the data that you have, an understanding of the limitations of that data, um, and also develop how, what is the problem you're trying to answer? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's very, very easy to put some data into a machine learning algorithm and it will give you an answer. But if that, but the question is, does that answer have any meaning? Because it's, it's a computer algorithm. It's just like anything else. You can throw some random data, it'll then spit out some numbers. But the question is, do those numbers have meaning? And what, what do they mean? And it's only through the, the thinking about the hypothesis and understanding the data that you have and how they represent the problem that you're trying to answer, that you can really then get that to actually have some sort of meaningful use. Uh, it's very easy to do bad science with machine learning. That's that's one thing that I'm, I'm trying to drive forward is that the data is incredibly important. And, and also, I guess, the application, you know, if you, as you were saying about speed or accuracy, you know, if, if you think of the examples of things like identifying vehicles uh, for automated driving, if you have a model that perfectly understands what a car is, but it takes 20 seconds to run every image, you can't use that to self-drive a car because it will crash and then say, oh, there was a car. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so exactly. it's different. you need to know what your measure of success and, and functionality is. Uh, yeah, exactly. So you need to, you need to know what you're you're trying to achieve before you before you start doing it. And it's sometimes it's very tempted to just go running in um, and, and try a whole bunch of different things. But I think it's stopping and thinking about what you're trying to do. And um, on on terms of your comment about um, sort of the data and the understanding of the data, that's absolutely correct. Um, I probably spend eighty to ninety percent of my time looking at data, analyzing data, manipulating data, and less than 10% of my time actually doing, actually training a neural network or actually training a random forest or anything. Uh, that, that is such a small component of, and writing the code to do that, such a small component of my day-to-day -day work as a machine learning data scientist. The data scientist takes 90% of the time, the data wrangling, the gathering the data together, the understanding the input variables, understanding the domain context. And it's only five to ten percent is the actual. This is the machine learning algorithm bit, um, and, and I think that's a really important point to to get across. Is that it's it's ninety percent data wrangling. Thank you, Dave. Um, I've collected some more questions. There were more questions coming in. Great. Um, <laughs> so we carry on. Um, there's a question about the neural network classification application. Mm -hmm. and how you would define the number of pixels or dimensions of the training samples and whether you would degrade the pixel resolution to fit, to fit uh, the number of pixels uh, from a database of samples and how you would address different scales of phenomena that you might be studying. Lots of different questions. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's quite a few things within that. Yeah. Um, so I'll go through them one by one, and then if I forgot any, you can remind me. Yes, yes. Um, so when you're building a neural network structure, um, you can manually define the number of input variant, the number of input nodes that you have, and the number of inputs you have, or the shape that that might take. Um, so a lot of images will typically deal with, I don't know, 256 by 256 pixels by three channels, so red, green, and blue. In our observation, we can change the, the the size of those different images that we have, um, and the number of pixels and the, uh, the number of uh, bands in the, that context would be the number of 
uh, yeah, in, indices, uh, the number of indices or bands or input features that we might have. Um, so there's an ability to manipulate that around a little bit. Um, when I have large Earth observation data, I'll typically cut out small tiles and then feed them in one at a time into my uh, neural network. And I'll play around with the sizes of them. So some of them might be smaller, some of them might be larger. The smaller ones, um, we've got less data within an image, but I've got more tiles that I can then apply so I can go through a larger data set. So sometimes it could be more useful. So that's something that needs to be experimented with uh, and depends on the, the specific domain I'm looking at. Um, I tend to try and uh, follow um, well-documented machine learning models. Um, it's very tempting to try and start plugging together all these different things myself, but models that have been proven to work in a whole series of different domains um, will generally work consistently in a whole different series of different domains. So there are certain models that I'll um, come back to that have been tested in computer vision, that have been tested in medical imaging, um, and if I can take them and apply them to Earth observation as well, I'll use existing structures rather than trying to build everything from scratch from the ground up. Um, let's let's take expertise that other people have who built and put into um, the AI and machine learning field, and let's just work on uh, on top of their shoulders. Because um, really, the the interesting thing for me is the application to Earth observation, not the building of new um, AI models. Um, I think there was a third point, but I forgot. There was um, um, the different scales of phenomena that you might be um, observing. Um, so, how do you classify those uh, in relationship to sort of how you define the number of pixels or the number of dimensions? So, I guess that kind of depends, and I kind of want to know a bit more. <laughs> easy as to what's going on there, but if you're um, if you're trying to study trends over an entire ocean, then I think having all the individual pixels are, are going to be useful. But your end output prediction is going to be um, a single prediction um, over that entire ocean. So that's mm. then looking at using a neural network structure that can can do that. Um, but when you're trying to predict things on a, you, you can't really do much prediction. Well, you can try doing prediction on sub pixel scales, uh, but it becomes quite a lot more challenging to do that. So it depends on what sort of extreme you're going for. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how else to, to generalize that. But, um, I don't have more information no, either. So, uh, I, I, so I think you've done a really good job answering this question. <laughs> Um, so there was quite a practical question. So one of the trainees uh, wanted to know whether you need any special computers to do machine learning and what are the minimum requirements for some of these techniques? If you're looking at um, some sort of traditional machine learning approaches, you could run them on most desktop computers. Um, the question at that point is really how big is your data and it just is the amount of time it takes to cycle through your data. But if you want to look at something like uh, a random forest or a support vector machine, you should be able to run them on most desktop computers reasonably well. If you start looking into neural networks and larger data sets, it becomes really helpful to have access to particular hardware, like a graphic processing unit, a GPU, and that's just heavily optimized to run these machine learning models in. There's a few places you can get them for free. So if you have a Google account, you can sign up for Google Colab. Uh, Google C O L A B Colab, um, and they offer free GPU resource for scientific purposes, so you can explore things and play around. It's time limited um, and data limited in terms of Google Drive, and it's also highly owned by Google, but that can be quite a good resource. Um, or look at some institutions that have some some bigger compute facilities when you're looking at bigger projects. But um, one of my previous PhD students managed to do an entire um, PhD in machine learning applied to different domains purely using free Google resource, uh, and that was enough to do a doctoral uh, degree. So um, it's definitely possible to do it with free resources, but your life becomes easier when you've got more compute. Thank you, Dave. That's really good to know that some of these techniques you can run on your desktop and there are other resources available. Um, there was a question related um, to your, well, considerations and limitations. Um, so, have you conduct, conducted any benchmarking studies comparing 
um, the accuracy of machine learning or deep learning methods against traditional uh, numerical modeling techniques um, in the context of environmental forecasting. So I guess to summarize the question, whether you've compared results from machine learning, deep learning with uh, numerical modeling. Um, I have not done any direct comparisons. Um, there's a couple of projects that I've worked on um, where we've looked at building model emulators. Um, and this kind of goes back to the question of what's the problem you're trying to solve and how do you evaluate it? Because in this case, um, we knew we weren't necessarily going to get the same results as a, a numerical model because um, those large computational model, models are so physically realistic and contain so much information. Um, the, the purpose of that was never to replace them, but it was all about how we can do it with a lot more speed. So instead of running for, um, you know, for six hours for a single day's output, we then instead looked at how we could run a machine learning model that would run in a few seconds to give us a similar day's worth of output as our, um, as our, uh, in our case, it was a biogeochemical ocean model. Um, but the idea is that we could do that in a few seconds with a lot less compute. And that's really useful because we can make it a lot more accessible. The results weren't as good, but we were quite happy to take that 10% reduction in accuracy for that, you know, um, I think it was 10,000 or um, thousands of order speed up. Um, because in those cases, we can try a few more different experiments and we can also make that model available to stakeholders or we, we will in the future aim to make that model available to stakeholders um, to have a bit more understanding. Um, so that will contain less accuracy. Are the important thing to explore in that area is how does it perform in the extremes as well? So we need to make sure that it will still represent things in the extreme values. So you're not getting obscure results. And in some cases, that's cutting off access to results and just say, we won't output something if we're not confident about the result. Um, so I've done those sorts of benchmarkings where we can make, increase the speed um, and sacrifice the accuracy, but I've not done anywhere on deck directly trying to replace uh, those numerical models. Thank you, Dave. Um, there might also uh, there might be some literature about this uh, if people are are interested in finding out more about that. Um, last question, I think. Um, is there a method that is best suited to extract spatial temporal patterns from time series or satellite images? Um, to extract. Patterns, um, yeah. I guess. So spatial temporal well, patterns, yeah. So if you're trying to combine spatial and temporal patterns, um, it's quite complex and challenging to do that with traditional machine learning methods. So you really need to be looking at some sort of deep learning approaches. Um, if you want to look at spatial things, uh, usually you're looking at some sort of convolutional neural network, um, and if you want to look at Temporal patterns, you're looking at some sort of recurrent neural network. So uh, convolutional basically means you've got some spatial element and recurrent is you're looking at some sort of time series. Um, so there, there's, a whole, there's a whole domain of people exploring different avenues and approaches um, from RCNN, which is recurrent convolutional neural networks. And that's then trying to look at spatial temporal patterns in, um, in videos and things like that. Uh, there's some very recent developments in uh, what are called transformers and looking at attention. Um, but those, some of those are quite, uh, they're very, uh, probably about four or five years old and they're uh, very popular at the moment and they would definitely be ways to explore. Um, but there's quite a lot of them are quite complicated things to explore directly. Um, and so trying to combine spatial and temporal at the same time, is, is quite a challenging thing to do and really means you need to get into the nitty gritty of deep learning, I suppose. Um, so if I was doing that, I would look at trying to do um, some sort of, yeah, convolutional and recurrent neural network approach, and maybe then start looking at some autoencoder structure and then see if I can extrapolate that out and identify some sort of time series. But I, I think it really depends on the domain and being a bit more specific, sorry. That's okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, that was the last question. I don't know if there are any more questions from the panel. Ashuba. Thank you, Gemma. And thank you, Dave, for an inspiring talk there. Um, 
If you're not too tired, I had one or two simple questions to ask. Are you dying for your lunch? In that case, I would not. No, that's it. fine. I, I can answer one or two of your simple questions. Okay. Here is one, the one. It's a little bit of a follow on from the question that asked whether you could use AI for weather forecast. My question is, what do you have to be careful about if you want to do it for climate forecast? The re, and in a changing climate. Here is the background to my question. AI is learning from the data you give it. By definition, it is from the past. Yes. And the system is changing in the future. So can we deal with that? Um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. The machine learning is learning from the data that you give it. So essentially, in order to build something that's making some sort of prediction of trajectories, you need to learn from some historic data where you know what's happened. So, in a case where you've got something accelerating, you need to consider what what the inputs are and what things are driving. Um, and so, you will probably need to consider a lot more than just looking at temperature and time. You need to probably look at carbon outputs, some sort of understanding of ozone. Um, you really want to make sure that you're actually understanding the problem and your model is learning the right thing. And I think this is where you need to go into some um, like um, exploratory AI or adversarial AI approaches to really question it and say, but what happens if this, what happens if this, and to try and find cases where it breaks and where it's wrong. Um, because we need to be very careful that we're not building a system that says, oh, but it's fine because this prediction says it will come down in the same way as a numerical model. For every model that you have that represents something going up and back down again in some cyclical pattern, uh, you'll have another model that will say the opposite. Um, and it's very easy to build a model that gives you a prediction that you want in one particular case. Um, it's very difficult to build a model that is right. Um, so uh, I would definitely explore where that model is performing incorrectly. Um, and also, yeah, what domains you just can't represent because we, we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, climate is a very uh, a massive problem and it's not something that um, I would expect a machine learning algorithm to be able to solve in in a short period of time, um, but it might give us a better understanding. I'm I'm not I'm not sure. Okay. I would be very cautious though. Thank you. Um, that's um, I think it's an important point. But, um, I would agree. Yeah, but it, related to that and related to your answer, you said we could use these exploratory things to find out. The what happens, what if, if then kind of questions. From that kind of an approach, can you extract functional relationships between your variables um, so that we can then see if these um, uh, mo the ecosystem models that are typically used for predicting the future? if those models are treating the processes in the right way to somehow extract some functional relationships from the exploratory i thought you said this would be easy questions <laughs> <laughs> um so fundamentally when we're building a machine learning model we're all we're doing is learning from the data firstly um, and then what we can do with these exploratory AI approaches is query what that model has learned hmm. um, and, and, and the relationships it's formed in its head to try and understand why it's making decisions it's making. So that means that we could, if the model is 100% accurate, we could query it and then say, why is this happening? Um, and then it will say, oh, well, there's a relationship between these things and then we could extrapolate it back. I wouldn't, I don't think that's particularly sound approach because I think we have a much better understanding of the physical environment than a machine learning approach might do in a pile of data. I think it's something we might be able to do in some situations, but it's something we need to be cautious of. Um, if it's something we're, we're not sure of and we can say, look, this might be an explanation for these situations, further work is needed. 
that would then be going and setting up a series of independent experiments yeah. um, to, to test those hypotheses. So to, to generate hypotheses that we could then go and test if we're not sure about those interactions, yes. Anything more than that and saying, oh, well, may I said that these things are related and this causes this, we, we cannot create a causal relationship with a model that we've represented from that data. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's very useful. Um, I guess, would it be fair then to summarize that these machines may be intelligent, but they may not have much common sense? I think that's a reasonable way of looking at it. Well, they're intelligent. Well, they're, they replicate intelligence. They look intelligent. Um, common sense is defined by the context and everything else around you. And the only thing they've seen is the data that they have access to. Exactly. Yeah. So, so they, they don't have a wider context other than the data you provided. So, uh, at which point it would be impossible to have context or an understanding outside of the data that it's seen. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I think, I think that would be a reasonable way of putting it. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure everybody wants to thank you. So I'll step out of the way saying thank you from me. And much appreciate your contribution. Thank you very um, much. We're, we're going to wrap up. Thank you, Dave. There are lots of compliments in the chat. Everyone's really excited. Good presentation. Thank you. It was well structured, easy to follow. Um, so you've done a great job. Um, so that's the end of today's um, training lecture. Last one is next week. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing everyone there again um, for our final online lecture. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome.